So for the podiatrist watching, you, you may or may not have heard of Adam. And if you haven't, don't, don't beat yourself up about it. It's because he's, he's, his expert area is the shoulder, which, you know, uh, you know, we don't keep massively up to date on. Don't be offended by that. But, but actually, if you are on social media, you probably have, whether it be Twitter or Facebook, even Instagram now, you, you, you've you been a bit of a latecomer to that, but you're, uh, you seem to be um, anywhere you go, sort of uh, the, the, the audience grows. So any, any social media channel that you dabble on, you might have come across Adam, you might have come across some of his comments, some of the fights he's been in. I mean, it's just incredible popcorn stuff. And um, one thing that, that, that comes up time and time again, um, it seems to at least, um, is the topic of manual therapy. And probably because you've got such, such strong opinions on it, and obviously those strong opinions draw uh, strong opposing opinions, and, and the fireworks fly, and it's exciting for everyone. And we wanted to, to bring this to the podiatry sort of chat here, uh, because manual therapy, I don't know how, you have, how much you're aware of manual therapy within podiatry. Not at least. But, you know, I, I, it's probably fair to say that, that it's, it's nowhere near as prevalent as it is in physio. But, you know, it's, there's a real, real uh, following within podiatry and there are courses that are run and, and people were uh, sort of really subscribing to it. So we thought it would be a reasonable topic to, to talk out, if nothing else. Um, I've had some questions that have come through beforehand that we're going to run through. And obviously anyone that's watching uh, anything that we say fire away and comment anything that you want to ask that comes to mind fire away and comment and we'll try to get to all of it but adam has to be away by 9 p.m our time um at least he says he does that's just probably his caveat for you know it's a bit like when you go to a party you don't want to go to isn't it and you, you tell people i can't stay long <laughs> make your excuses before you can yeah. turn. <laughs> let's see how it goes um so uh, how are we doing Craig? i've got 28 people on yeah, should we just get get Good crappy yeah yeah Super. Right. So uh, straight off the bat, a reasonable place to start. One that you may not get asked much in your physiotherapy circles, but, but we're going to ask it now. And that is, what is manual therapy? When, when does something become manual therapy? What, 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 what is governed by the umbrella that is referred to as manual therapy? Uh, that's a great question. So for me, I think it's anything that involves um, uh, hands-on for a sustained period to a patient. So uh, you know, I, I always use, or people always throw the, uh, excuse me, that Adam Meekins never touches his patients because he doesn't do manual therapy. And that's rubbish because I touch every patient I see because I shake their hand, I give them a pat on the shoulder if they need some encouragement. So I touch patients, but I wouldn't class that as manual therapy. I even sometimes, you know, I assist and guide movements when people are uh, struggling, fearful, need to get some encouragement. So, you know, there's, there's, it's hands-on in my day-to-day -day work, but it's not what I'd class as manual therapy. So for me, manual therapy is hands-on for a sustained period, normally with the patient lying down. So they're normally on a plinth. They're normally having something pressed, poked, pulled, rubbed, massaged, scraped, or something, or poked or needled or stabbed or something. So I think uh, for me, that pretty much uh, comes under the umbrella of manual therapy. So again, right. I would even clue manip I know manipulations isn't a sustained period of time. Somebody will say, you know, you, you do it and it's done and dusted in, you know, 0.4 of a second or something along those lines. But that, that is still a hands-on technique that, you know, you have to assess, you have to feel for things and everything all comes under the umbrella of manual therapy. Great. So straight on to, to question two off the back of that. Um, and anyone that knows you and your, your take on this and has read your work on this will know where this question is coming from. Why does it suck? Manual therapy sucks being something that uh, you're, you're well known for saying that you've, put, you've had put on a t-shirt. Um, I think Craig, oh, Craig's going to put pop out there now. Um, this Available at www. <laughs> <laughs> all all this, proceeds this, go to charity. This, uh, this t-shirt got you in a spot of bother, which we'll talk about in a minute if that's okay. But, but first and foremost, let's get to the, to the crux of it. Um, why does it suck? Manual therapy sucks. Talk us through, you know, your, your rationale for that comment. It's something that's been born over a process of time. So it did, I didn't just wake up one evening and said, right, fuck it, manual therapy sucks. So I, uh, I, it's something that's just sort of wore me down gradually to the point of no return and to the point now where, and I've, I've written another blog about it and used the word hate. I, I do hate manual therapy because of everything it's, it's done to me and to the profession over the years. And, you know, and if you're finding your profession being uh, infested with manual therapy, I do feel sorry for you because I think a lot of podiatrists will be going down the same pathway that I have because it is very alluring because manual therapy does 
it, it basically draws you in with a false premise and false belief that is very uh, plausible to a certain degree. Um, it's very exciting. It sounds very skilled. It sounds very sexy. It sounds very scientific. But at the end of the day, it's none of that things. The more you start to read, the more you start to learn, you'll find that they say that all these so-called highly technical skilled interventions are not. The effects that you're led to believe or the outcomes that you're led to believe that you, are, you, you get with manual therapy are not. There's, there's millions, millions of other plausible explanations as to why manual therapy gets its effects and not the ones that you were taught. Um, it costs a fucking shitload as well. Excuse my language. I know it's not before the watershed, but I get <laughs> about this. So apologies it's, for anybody it's listening. Expected. It's expected. Um, <laughs> again, I, I, I mean, the biggest sort of, you know, rudge, I suppose, I've got against manual therapy. If I look back over the years as a young physiotherapist at all the postgraduate courses that I went on, and looked at the, the cost of those courses and these certifications that I had to go for and these accreditations that I had to keep updated on a yearly basis with the so-called special interest groups in uh, manipulation, acupuncture, dry needling, because I've done it all. Um, I, I, I think I've toted it up somewhere along the line. It's well over £10,000 of money. £10,000. That, that's, that's a cost of another degree, more or less, you know. Um, so uh, that is a big bugbear for me, and 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 now, as I say, when when I look back, it just makes my my heart bleed because I just think I could have paid off a mortgage, or I could have got a nice little motorbike with that money instead, and that would have been far more fun and enjoyable for me. <laughs> so that, that that's one of the reasons manual therapy works, and and the other thing is I just see it robbing time out of the uh, the consultation times that we have with patients. I just see it as 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 frivolous, wasteful spa treatments that that don't actually address the underlying issues that a lot of patients have got and and again it's, it's due to the way it's been marketed uh, and the gurus out there as well which is another reason i hate it because it's got this very much guru culture behind it you know you get this hierarchical uh, system in manual therapy where people actually genuinely believe if you can't feel these things, you are not worthy. If you can't palpate something, if you can't create a change in a patient, you shouldn't call yourself a physiotherapist. You need to try harder. And, and that shit winds me up as well. Uh, and it is, and it gets disheartening for therapists. And I see people trusting it. They see, I see these young therapists going on these courses, trying to, to learn these techniques. And when they start to put it into practice in clinical uh, situations and scenarios outside of the classroom, outside of the courses, you see their little hearts start to break because they realize ah, th th this is not what I was promised. You know, I I'm doing this and not every patient's getting better. I do this and I can't create what I was supposed to create according to this guy in this course. And the gurus then will put them down and say, well, it's not the fault of the manual therapy. It's you. You're the problem. You just need to practice harder. You're not worthy. You've got to keep trying. And it's bullshit. And that, that, that winds me up a lot. So my, my passion with manual therapy is to try and educate the young therapists coming through not to be fooled by the sexy, sciencey, shiny stuff with this manual therapy because it, it will disillusion you and it will, like it did with me, it almost made me quit the profession. That and other things as well. But I, I was almost going to jack it all in because I just felt worthless as a manual therapist, as a physiotherapist, that all these techniques that I was supposed to do and things that I was supposed to feel I just couldn't. But then I thought, no, well, I'm not going to give it. I'm going I'm to look a bit more. And then I started to read the research on the background of the stuff that they don't tell you about manual therapy. You know, and there is a large body of literature of evidence out there that is poorly known because the manual therapists will not ex use it. They will not look at it. You know, we're all biased. You know, we all, we all have our preferences of reading research that interests us. I get that. But, you know, there is these other papers out there that just constantly challenge the narrative that manual therapists give as cause and effect of what it does. And so, again, I just don't think it's, it's as well publicized. So that's one thing that I and, and there's a few others as well out there now trying to promote is the, you know, the other side of what manual therapy does. You know, and it is this non-skilled, non-specific um, neuromodulatory effects that's the new buzzword at the moment that's going around neuro fucking modulation basically just fucking about with somebody's nervous system that's what manual therapy is in a nutshell so when when people get better or sorry let me rephrase that you know you know more sensible way 
when a when a when a clinician performs manual therapy on on a on an individual uh, and that individual and they're not you know but they truly believe that it's been helpful it's been beneficial what, what is there any, what, what does the research suggest are the mechanisms behind that is it purely placebo is it purely sort of expectation is it you know uh, where does the research point us for me mate my, the, my current when somebody asks me what does manual therapy do that, that's, <laughs> that's 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 the current answer is like who knows let's let's just say it's open for debate so yes there could possibly you know plausible biomechanical explanations i'm not refuting that so there could possibly be some biomechanical effects from manual therapy but when you look at the forces that applied by the human hand onto human tissue and you look at the basic science of how much human tissue uh, needs to uh, take from a force to see any deformation you'll know that any effect biomechanically is going to be fleeting, brief, and nothing lasting or any of any significance. But I don't dispute that there is some possible biomechanical effect of, of there, but again, it's uncertain and it will be minimal to insignificant. So that's one explanation of what manual therapy does. Then as you rightly say, there's a massive placebo effect. So again, the expectation of something going to be working um, will create a, a, a beneficial effect of it working. So there is those non-specific contextual effects that go around manual therapy, and it, it and it's rich in that. It is very. I mean, placebo affects everything that we do as therapists. Our education has placebo effects. My cherished, beloved exercise has placebo effects. Um, but manual therapy is rich in placebo effects, and I would probably say it is the majority of how things work. So with manual therapy, as I say, the expectation, the belief, the way it's been worded uh, by the therapist to the patient, the, the priming that happens with it as well, all will set up a, an out, a positive outcome. And then there's that <coughs> other physiological effect, you know, the, the neuromodulatory effect. You know, you, you put in a stimulus, you put in something into a system, it will change a perception of, of, a, of an output. So again, you know, whether that's the pain, whether that's the stiffness, whether that's strength, you know, you, you can apply a stimulus and that, that will then go into a system, do some clever higgery jiggery pokery up in the central nervous system and create, change a, a sensation of an output. So there's lots of different mechanisms. Uh, and as I say, a lot of the time when someone says, well, I've done this and somebody feels better, what's going on there? And Touching on touching on two words you said there, uh, pain and output, which obviously we use together all the time nowadays. And you know this topic way better than I, so I don't want to make myself look foolish. But given our current understanding of pain neurology and pain being a sort of an output of the brain, yeah. and this output being a decision that the brain makes based on numerous things, uh, above all the level of real or perceived threat slash danger, yeah. um, is there an argument that you put your hands on someone in one way, shape, or form? And, and for whatever reason, it, it, it has the ability to reduce that threat or danger, and thus that be one of the, the mechanisms by which it reduces pain. And if so, is there any any time where you would you Adam Meekins would hold your hand up and say manual therapy has a place? Um, well, go back to your first question. Yeah, you know, you reduce threat, you reduce pain, you reduce that. Simple as that. Um, but there's lots of ways to reduce threat. You know, again, I see manual therapists jumping on the hands-on techniques as a way to reduce threat without considering other ways to reduce threat first, which are simpler, easier, cheaper, and more efficient to apply. And that's just simple education. You can de-threaten something by, you know, good, honest advice, guidance, and education. So, you know, affected my, one of my all-time heroes, God bless him, rest his soul, Louis Gifford, famously said it, you know, effective reassurance is a bloody good, good painkiller. And I'm totally I'm totally with that. And again, all you've done there is you, you've reduced threat by just giving effective reassurance, advice, and guidance. So I will say, yes, manual therapy can do the same thing. It can reduce threat. You know, putting hands on can be soothing. It can be comforting. You know, you all can remember a time when you've, we're a child and you grazed your knee and you felt terrible and your mum comes along and soothes you. You know, she doesn't, she doesn't heal you, but it just makes you feel better. So, cause it's just reduced the threat of a, of a, a threatening stimulus. 
So yeah, theoretically it could do that. And I suppose, you know, you could justify the use of manual therapy for that. But again, it's just, it's, it's the time and the, and the threat that, that, that it takes or like the cost that it takes to apply that. that. That's the argument I will say. Anything that a manual therapist think they can do to help somebody move with less pain or um, better functional ability, I, I, will, I will say anything you can do with your hands, I can either do with my mouth or with a patient moving and doing some form of novel exercise because it does the same thing. What, what about... What about manual therapy, if there, whether it's a shoulder, spine, or a joint in the foot that's got a restricted range of motion and using a manual therapy technique to increase that range? Yeah, that, that's, again, something that people think has this biomechanical effect, breaking down adhesions, cross linkages, scar tissue, uh, all that sort of stuff. It doesn't do any of that. You know, the research tells us, again, just go back to the basic science. You know, if you've got somebody that has a restriction because of, let's say there is some scar tissue after a trauma around a joint in some soft tissue that is biomechanically impeding and restricting that joint from moving to its end of ranges. The forces that a manual therapist that will apply with their fingers, okay, and the amount of time they will apply it for will just absolutely make zilch difference to the actual physiological structure now range of movement can change but that again can be due to these other effects these neuromodulatory effects but the actual physiological effects haven't or the physiological aspect of that joint and that, that soft tissue will not have changed one iota let's go back and look at the stretching research to see how fucking hard it is to change connective tissue you can, you can see studies where they've looked at, you know, tendons and muscle linkages uh, under aggressive stretching regimes for 6, 8, 12 weeks, and the tissue doesn't change one bit. The actual, you know, tension of the soft tissue doesn't change. Maybe, if anything, the stiffness increases. You see stretching actually create an increase in stiffness in the soft tissue, but range of movement changes. So again, that's that neuromodulatory effect because the stretching down regulates the sensations of stretching. So if you think that you say that it's six weeks of aggressive stretching every day, you know, I think some people are doing it, you know, for up to five, eight minutes a day, regular stretching doesn't change tissue uh, quality. Why would you think that your fingers applied to a specific part of the body for 30 minutes once a week or even 10 minutes for once a week or whatever you're applying it for does does anything different it just doesn't so no i would say again you know the beliefs that these manual therapy things with hands pushing and poking changes tissue just doesn't do that moving on um you know as we know with these uh pod chat lives we don't pay our guests but we I sometimes buy little what? gifts that we, we some, oh, did I not mention it I sometimes, <laughs> buy, I sometimes buy little gifts that i'm going to post on later and i've got this i got this for you and i'm just gonna i'm gonna post it out to you love um, that one uh, i haven't probably, seen that one Jan, it, who's the author uh here we go wow no not come across that one um but let's talk trigger points because I know you, you you wrote an editorial for the the BJSM on on, on trigger points or, or perhaps the, the the less more more appropriate name for them. Um, uh, talk us through sort of the, the the belief about trigger points. Do they exist? If so, what are they? If not, what are they? The the well the, the, the layman's term for a trigger point is a is an adverse contraction of part of the um, muscle unit normally at the neuromuscular end plate. Uh, so you have this adverse uh, firing sequence going on on the neural system, which causes a overactivity, a hypertonicity of the, of the surrounding area of muscle tissue, which develops this muscle knot. So that's what technically is a, is a trigger point in a layman's terms. But again, they haven't been conclusively proven. There's been a few studies that have tried to evaluate it and look at it, but they haven't been reproduced. So again, this is the other issue with this sort of stuff is that, you know, you'll see a paper being banded around that says, aha, there's proof of these trigger points. We've got it here. But when you look at the authors and where they're getting their income from, you see that they've got high bias to find these trigger points. Yet when these studies are tried to be reproduced, they are unable to find them. And that's if they are reproduced. Again, sometimes they're not. So let's just say that there's been no conclusive proof for actual physiological um, areas of hypertonicity or over contraction in in muscles 
So the old muscle knot theory is something that I, I, will, I will refute. And again, the belief that a therapist can actually palpate these, again, I will refute because there's no reliability in searching for them. So that's, that's the biggest issue that I think trigger point ther uh, therapists have to get over is that if they think somebody's got a muscle knot, all they have to do is then get another therapist in and not tell them where that muscle knot is and say, can you go and find that muscle knot I've just found? And they won't because there's no reliability in it. And there's been lots of studies that looked at that. Um, so, you know, if it did exist, you know, you've got to be able to find it. And there isn't, there isn't even that ability. So, and then the other things I say is I'm not disputing that, you know, people feel pain in soft tissues. Well, again, that's probably the wrong word to use. I'm not disputing people perceive a discomfort in coming from their soft tissue, but I don't actually believe it is actually from the soft tissue. There's a few other theories that have been banded around as to why people feel these sore spots in various different areas when people poke them. Um, one of them is the cutaneous nerve theory. So there's a belief that the cutaneous nerves underneath the skin are, are a possible suspect again, but again, nothing conclusive. So it's believed that a lack of uh, blood flow to these cutaneous nerves is what creates a, a noxious effect. And then people perceive that, that as being a contractile issue or a muscle knot. Uh, and that might explain why there's no reliability because if there isn't actually a knot or a pee that people can feel, but they've just got an area of pain, that may be why you can't when you blind a therapist uh, get this reproducibility of, uh, of feeling the knots. Um, so yeah, for me, there's, there, I, I just use the term soft tissue sore spots of an unknown origin. People will feel or perceive discomfort and pain in their soft tissues, but what they are is of an unknown origin. And again, it could be something as, as simple as that it's a postural strain or stress. It's something as Something just as a fear or factor is they've been primed to say or think it's a, a muscle knot. So the expectation is that's what it is. Let's say who knows. And uh, just off the back of something you said there, and there's another point that came in about this sort of issue with palpation. And I think uh, I saw one of your talks once. Uh, we talked together, I don't know if you remember, at um, Therapy Expo about five years ago. Do you remember? Yeah, you, yeah I did. You, yeah. Pre, it was pre-beard days. Yeah. You had a, lo a lovely tweet number on. And you did a talk, um, uh, and I believe it was called Palpation Paradoia, or at the very least it had it had the picture of a dog's anus in it, uh, you know, which is, which is a very difficult thing. Craig, don't Google dog's anus if your girls use that same computer. <laughs> and um, but the, 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 the gist was that, you know, we, we trick ourselves into feeling things that we don't feel. Now, at foot level, you could argue, particularly if someone's very lean, we've got bony landmarks, and you could argue we, we're, we're in the right ballpark. But I still think when you get into the midfoot, which is like a horrible, confusing bag of marbles, I think it gets complex. But uh, as you know, and we'll come to the cuboid in a second. That's something we definitely got to talk about. But we've got um, certain people in our profession traveling a bit north of the foot, as far, as far north as the pelvis. And uh, talking about how they can palpate changes and mutations in the SI joint. Now, I read a paper once, and I'm sure it said, or, or a comment once, and it said something about palpating the SI joint is, is, is like trying to read Braille through a steak, an uncooked steak, or something along those lines. I mean, put, give me your take on this. Is it possible to palpate the SI joint to within a few degrees? It's got to be. <laughs> Yeah, no, simply put, no, mate. I, I've, I've, <laughs> um, I've, yeah, I've got to give a shout out for that palpation pareidolia as well, because that's, that's not one of my uh, ones. I, I, I used, borrowed that term from a, an excellent massage therapist called Paul Ingram, uh, who's from Canada. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah pain yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've got to give a shout out for him because he's excellent. And I, I would suggest any manual therapist to who wants to challenge their biases and thinking about what manual therapy does is just go and look at painscience.com at Paul Ingram's body of work. He, he, he will open your eyes to this other side of the literature because he is one of the people that has helped me astronomically over the years understand a, a shitload more about um, what manual therapy can't do. Um, but yeah, so to go back to that, that question about the sacroiliac joint, can you palpate the sacroiliac joint? The simple answer is no. Yeah, there you go. There's Paul. Yes. So great work he does there. So he's, he's got a body of work that makes me jealous. You know, I've got about 150 blogs. He's got about a gazillion. And they're, <laughs> they're always updated and they're, they're top-notch scientific researched as well. So, 
So actually, I've just had a comment in from Simon Dickinson, who's, who's hi Simon. He's a good guy. He's a really top orthotist, and I think he's he's read between the lines here of what I was referring to. And he said, "What's your? And you, I don't know if you know about this. Is what's your opinion on pelvic equilibrium theory? Uh, and in fact, no, I do know. You do know about this. Um, yeah. So because... <laughs> the you can you can measure the difference between the was it the ASIS and the PSIS, and then. Yeah. You've got to go on a course. You've got to go on a course to know how to do it, of course. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. To use the inclinometer, but um, the suggestion is that it will it will identify why the pathology is there, and it will also completely dictate how you should intervene at foot level with with orthoses. Um, reliability uh, issues and and causation correlation issues and and fallacies and confirmation. But I mean, where, where do you start with that? I mean, I don't want to get into that, but. The simplest way to start with that is just purely reductionist thinking for a very complex thing such as pain. That, that, that's, that's the end of the conversation there. To think that pain is, is, is causative by one biomechanical factor, which could, you know, when you argue it and reason it, is plausible. It's just reductionist thinking because pain is a multifactorial experience. It's not as simple as leg length discrepancies. It's not as simple as pelvic, uh, pelvis is being out of alignment. So no, it's say it's just reductionist thinking, and, with, and, and therapists have just got to move beyond this now. I know I was taught a very reductionist way of thinking. I was taught a biomedical medical way of assessing and treating. The times are changing. Times are moving on. Our research, our evidence, our understanding has shifted. It's going to take time. I get that. People, some people move faster and slower than others when it comes to, you know, understanding and keeping up with the literature, but. Pain isn't as simple as fucking SIJs being out of imbalance. That's even if you could feel that in the first place. So the simple answer is you can't. So again, I was taught as a young therapist to palpate, you know, sacral depths and work out whether you had a torsion, which would then make a, uh, a functional leg length difference or a true leg length difference. And that's because of sacral uh, tension in some of the ligaments and all that sort of crap. And it is just bullshit. There is absolutely no way or reliability to be able to palpate these bony landmarks. The, the, the thing that everybody forgets about is normal anatomical variation. Oh, oh fucking, there was a paper, I can't remember, but it's so long ago, there was a paper that looked at cadavers. I think it was about 35 cadaver pelvises. And they looked at, on these cadavers, just the normal variation between the heights of the PSIS and the ASIS. And they found there was up to 23 degrees difference on 30 cadavers or 35 cadavers so you've just got that normal anatomical variance between the bony landmarks that you're feeling so you go how do you determine whether one is twisted down higher than the other because of so-called torsions and fucking things pulling on it where it shouldn't do or whether that's just an anatomical variation for that particular person's uh, pelvises the simple answer is you can't so a bony landmark um palpation to measure things nah i i would say you, you're 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 going you're barking up the wrong tree if you're wasting your time in assessments doing that you're barking up the wrong tree of using your time in assessment wonderful um is that, is that, is that rant is that ranty enough yeah actually we just, uh, just got, a, got a little comment here from hamish tectonic fault lines shift and slip sijs don't <laughs> <laughs> um that's a great one. Who was it? And Pete Rose Sullivan. You know, you'd say really it joint is, is bomb proof. You know, I don't, <laughs> I don't, I wouldn't put a bomb to it, but I think, yeah, I'd say SIJs, they are resilient bloody structures. You know, the other issue I think that a lot of therapists have is that they don't actually do cadaver dissections, especially mm -hmm. physios. I don't know what the podiatrists are like, but us physios, especially in the UK, they don't, they don't let students actually go and dissect cadavers. Cause if they dissected cadavers more, they'd actually realize, Fuck me, human beings are made of tough stuff. Hacking away through it, okay, with a frigging scalpel, trying to cut back and peel back layers, and then trying to actually physically move a, 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 an SI joint on a, you know, a fresh cadaver, one that hasn't been frozen, so you know, it's literally fresh, so it's not stiff because it's got all that sort of frozen formaldehyde in it. You will just realize, nah, that ain't happening. And that'll give, that'll give therapists a whole new understanding about what manual therapy just can't do, I'm sure of it. Yeah, we, we do quite a bit of, I don't know what it's like in Australia, Craig can pitch in, we do quite a bit, of, or at least when I trained, that was sort of, uh, 18 years ago now, but you know, we, in our first year, we, we had an afternoon every week 
in the in the in the uh, dissection lab every single week. Um, and, and you do, you, I completely agree, you look at this structure completely differently. First off, not, everything isn't coloured. <laughs> Muscles aren't red and, ve and ve uh, nerves aren't yellow. It's super annoying. Um, and that, even back then, and I, well, let's come on to the cuboid. Because in our world, there's a lot of talk about cuboid subluxation and, and sort of almost you know, manipulating and mobilising it back into place. And if you've ever looked in, if you've ever you know, dissected a foot, you look at the cuboid and I, I take some convincing that this thing can sublux in the first place. But not, you know, if you fall from height, of course, but on a daily basis, when someone comes into me with lateral midfoot pain, the cuboid being subluxed is literally the bottom of my list of differentials. Yet, what we have, and I'd love your take on this, because you don't have a dog in the fight, so to speak, um, when it comes to the podiatry world. Do you see many subluxed cuboids yourself? Do you see any feet? It's all up here for you, right? So, yeah, I, can't, I don't really see the feet, mate. Yeah, so let me talk you through this, just so you can, you can give us just uh, your viewpoint. Patient comes in with lateral midfoot pain. Clinician, rightly or wrongly, <coughs> wrongly says uh, cuboid subluxed. What we're going to do is we're just going to give a couple of uh, whips or you know whatever fancy jargon they're using, and we're going to pop it back into place. They apply this sort of cyclical loading, which you know may be having some effect on tissues, hysteresis, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But they're telling the patient that, that we're just going to pop this this bone back in place that's just slipped out of place. The patient, <laughs> the patient, uh, the individual, a lot of the time, at least according to the clinician, says, "Ah, oh, that feels so much better." And off they go. And I've heard this talked about with the talus as well. You know, the talus, which essentially, you know, I don't want to go there. Um, <laughs> but ultimately, we talked a bit earlier about sort of the idea of the theatre of it, the placebo effect, the psychology, the confirmation bias, the, the expectancy effects. And for me, we were talking earlier about how the patient, the person in, on the couch, has all of those things. Have you ever encountered groups of clinicians? being sort of uh, clouded by those things as well because I feel like either I'm missing out on something and and everyone's onto something and I just don't get it or are we heading the way of physiotherapy in that regard yeah I, I think you're at risk of doing that mate I think you know with these theories of you know things slipping out of place and we'll just pop it back in then yeah you're very much on a, on a slippery downward slope if clinicians are thinking that and explaining that to patients because it's not helpful it's harmful you know, the nocebic language that is is pretty much, it's horrendous. You might as well just tell patients they've got fucking cancer. Not quite, not quite as bad as that. But, you know, it, it, it's just, you know, th those thoughts of a bone that's loose that could just pop out by doing stuff, that, that's not going to help anybody. I mean, us in the physiotherapy world, we're just recovering from that with the fucking spine, with, with spinal instability for back pain, you know, getting people to suck up their bloody cores and draw in their transverse abdominis because we believed, again, of these, these movements that were occurring and causing instability and therefore causing their back pain. And it's taken us 20 years, and we're still not there yet. We've still got the ramifications of that. The belief in society that, you know, they have to do Pilates and core training to prevent their backs from becoming unstable is still there. And that was just us thinking about it just for a few years, back in the sort of late 80s, early 90s, when it started to come out, we thought about this theory and then we put it out there and we started playing around it and then, oh shit, no, that's wrong. But that just whoop, went down over a massive slope, gained momentum, build and build and build and build and build. And then we had this monstrous, horrendous effect. Uh, it was nocebic that we had to try and unpick. And it's confusing for the patients you know, because they're like, well, you told me a minute ago it was this, and now you're saying you're wrong, and now you've got to do this. So we lose trust in the patients. So, yeah, if you start doing that with the foot, uh, you're just going to end up going down the same pathway as physios have done with the back pain. So if you start blaming bones out of position, best of luck with that, people, because you will not come back <laughs> from that quickly. I, mean, I think for me as well, I'm, I'm a product of my environment. As you know, I spend way more time with physios surround, you know, than I do any other profession. So I'm surrounded by you guys uh, and, and girls at work. And I feel sorry for you. And I, and I, and I many years ago, I, you know, intentionally sort of um, followed a lot of physiotherapists on social media for this exact reason. And, and I definitely see the parallels. And when we're talking about, you know, um, how how uh, the, 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 the cuboid or the talus can move out of position, or we're talking about how, you know, your, your, your pelvic position means that you have, you're never going to be able to play sport again unless we give you this unilateral heel raise. 
I, I totally feel that this has the ability to instill this sense of fragility and hypervigilance and kinesophobia and all the stuff that my physio colleagues have taught me, as you've just said, are, are totally negative things. And we're far more likely to be driving people towards chronic or, sh or sh should I say persistent pain yep. than, w than we are driving them away from it. Is, is that, uh, is that, does that sound, uh, is that an exaggeration or is that a fair comment? Not not at all, mate. You say you're very much going down that pathway. If you keep using these terminologies in this profession and you start asking people to say, be mindful about what they're doing because it could come back out again or they have to take it carefully and do these certain specific exercises to correct this certain specific thing, it's just going to end up with, with more troubles than it will solve, mate. Absolutely. Um, but the, the, you know what the biggest downside of that is? Is it's not a good business model. Because... <laughs> Because that, that is, that's, the biggest, that's the biggest barrier I find when it comes to trying to educate therapists to do less, to do, to do minimum, to explain things simplistically, is one is their fear of it making them appear stupid and incompetent to the patient and to their peers. Nobody likes to explain things simplistically anymore. You know, nobody likes to say, you've just overdone it a little bit. You've got an ouchie, all right? There's nothing here for you to worry about. Goodbye. Because it makes you feel, say, awkward and it, there's a risk of fear and incompetence, especially when there's some wazzock down the road who's giving this very complex, sexy diagnosis. But the biggest barrier is fin finance. Because if you're working in the private sector, you rely on patients to come back to keep seeing you. And so telling patients there's nothing here to worry about, goodbye, I don't need to see you anymore, is a shitty business model. And that's the biggest barrier to, to, to modern healthcare. So I think until the incentives change, we're going to struggle to promote a more simple, rational, evidence-based way of treating people in pain. Because until we get, until we get incentivized to, to do things quickly, efficiently, and rewarded for uh, quick discharge, you know, make, making patients meet their goals efficiently, it, it, it's just not going to change, in my opinion. The more I've been doing this now over these last sort of five or so years and gone down this path, I've just realized this big, there's lots of barriers, but this is the biggest barrier. We, we, yeah. we, have, we have similar in, in podiatry with foot orthoses, as you know, they're massively overprescribed, in my opinion, uh, mass, given to huge amounts of people that probably don't need them. But at the same time, it's a, it's, it's a business model to give them out indiscriminately. And also, uh, I've definitely had people, I, I've given talks to rooms of podiatrists before and, and at the end someone's come up to me sort of quietly and, and sort of said, look, I'm totally, totally on board with everything you just said, but my concern here is if I don't, if, they, if someone comes to me and I'm not giving them orthoses, what am I doing? Yeah, and I am like, I going to pay them all yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, well, and it's like, I feel like if, if that's not what I'm doing, they don't, you know, they, then why would they be in the room? There's not anything, and I think that might be why manual therapy has slipped in. Because people are like, yeah. well, I need, I need another tool I don't want to just, you know, I don't, I don't want to dish out these things like Smarties at Kids Party, but I'll dish out Manips and Mopes, potentially. Bring yeah. it on to a, um, a topic. I mean, you said earlier about, you know, there's nothing, all the benefits that manual therapy does have or could have are one thing, but it can be achieved by other things in a better way. And I think one of the points there is you're far less likely to, to get the nocebic effect or that dependency of a patient. Uh, practitioner relationship and on that note not not to tie all chiropractors with the same brush but they get a hard time in this world um, for their models of practice um, a, a question just coming from Dave Dave Roberts asking you what your take is on chiropractic he knows one who trains in the same gym he seems to do very well I don't know whether that means with regard to what he benches or how much money he makes but um, <laughs> uh, but he's a he's a bit he's a <laughs> he's a bit he's a bit mental and you can see and hear how convincing he can be, persuading the mini gem members that they need some hands on treatment. Okay, so do worry, I'll probably means financial then. Um, that's just one chiropractor. Well, you know, we don't want to tile them all with the same brush, but what's your take on chiropractic with those that you know or that you've met or you've, you've, uh, you've sort of uh, inter interacted with? Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm not going to tire any profession because they're, all professions are as good as bad as each other, mate. I, I, again, I wrote a blog, you know, what, what's the best type of therapist? And I did that. Well, probably three or four years ago, because you people used to ask me this question a lot. And the simple answer is I see some chiropractors that are so up to date with the evidence and can, and, and can understand pain far better than, you know, physiotherapists or even some of the neurology pain specialists, you know. So I know there's some exceptional chiropractors out there keeping up to date with the evidence um, and, you know, and, and are exceptional clinicians. 
Um, but then there are a lot of chiropractors that aren't, you know, that are ascribing to the subluxation theory that are, you know, very charming and convincing and explain things in a very, you know, biomedical, biomechanical way alone. And, but then again, there's, there are physiotherapists like that. In fact, there are probably just as much physiotherapists like that as well. So I, I don't think any profession uh, or any profession has uh, the higher ground. I don't think anybody can claim that their profession is more scientific and more evidence-based than any others because I just don't see that in the literature and in my clinical experience as well. So, yeah, I, I don't tarnish anybody, as say, just by their title. It's about how they interact with their patients and what they understand of the literature, except yeah. for osteopractors. Osteopractors, they're <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what that word means if I'm honest. <laughs> it, 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 this is the crazy thing it's got so bad with the titles now is that they're actually bastardizing them and putting two together so there's this group of physiotherapists in the US who really annoy me and they claim oh, that, that Craig's got this ready he knew this was coming <laughs> <laughs> there you go the 10 best therapists but yeah, no, so these osteopractors are a group of therapists, uh, physiotherapists in the US who, who don't like their title. They don't like their, their name, uh, physiotherapist, which I just find insulting as a physiotherapist personally. You know, you spend three, four years of your life going through hard work, you know, getting your qualification, earning your title, and then you decide, no, I'm going to change it now. I'm going to call myself an osteopractor because I do more hands-on treatment as a physiotherapist. It's just bullshit. It just winds me up. It's confusing for the patients, let alone us as well. Regular, uh, regular adjustments of, of the patient's uh, wallets, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, can we touch on something we mentioned earlier, and, and we talked about your manual therapy sucks t-shirt, or your, you know, your, well, your manual therapy sucks uh, mantra, which then became a t-shirt, a range of t-shirts, but that was, that was the one that really got you in trouble because Someone made an official, or someone or people, I don't know, you, you can multiple. Have seen, but uh, multiple was it? There was, there was an official complaint made to your government body, the CSP, you know, and um, I, I guess a reason, if, if it's appropriate to talk about, could you tell us a bit about, you know, what the motivation of the, we don't need to mention any names, but what's the motivation of the people complaining? Is it when you get complaints, and I'm sure you, you have many, although that was probably the most formal one that I, I've seen you sustain yeah. but when you get complaints whether they be tweets or, or formal are they from the same group of people who are your main detractors and what's their what's their motivation uh, that's a very good question i mean i've had a few over the years um some are from people that just don't like my tone uh that don't like the way i express myself they think i'm too blunt i'm too insensitive i am rude and and i'll put my hands up to probably all of those i can be blunt insensitive and rude i know i can um, but again, that's just the way I am. I just, I just find myself when I see bullshit, I just, that's bullshit. And people say, oh no, you should sugarcoat that. I'm like, why should I have to sugarcoat it? <laughs> if it's blatantly, obviously bullshit, I'll just call it bullshit. But people don't like that, particularly online. They think that's harmful for the profession uh, and that I should be conducting myself in a more grown up, mature way. And I, I'd say I can sort of get that, but when people just focus on the tone and don't actually look at the, uh, the, the sort of the context of my argument, that does piss me off. Um, so there's a group that do that just because of my, my, my persona, I suppose. Um, but then there's also a group that just, you know, they don't like what I use because I am threatening their, their livelihoods, their income. They're, you know, they, they use predominantly passive interventions and, and they feel threatened that somebody's coming along and challenging it and showing Again, there's another way uh, of, of doing it that you don't have to use manual therapy. You don't have to go on these courses. I think that's the biggest one because the recent one that I say I got the complaint for, everybody on there, bar probably one or two who made the complaint, run courses on manual therapy or dry needling. So <laughs> I think that's the biggest factor is that I think I am probably having an impact on their income and their livelihood or I am having an impact on their, their lifelong body of work. So a lot of them were researchers as well. And I think, again, a lot of the researchers, they don't like their, their, the feeling that they've spent years of hard work and dedication and then somebody like me has come along and just pretty much swept it away and just said, nah, that's rubbish, that's bullshit. So I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of angst and animosity because of that. And again, I can understand that because I would be pretty pissed off if I'd spent five, 10 years of my life 
thinking that, you know, this was the way forward and you spent all that time reading and researching and writing papers and then somebody comes along and just blows it out of the water. You know, it, it takes a lot of gumption. It takes a lot of, lot of kahunas to actually take that on the chin and go, all right, I've made a mistake. I need to go down another path. The only, the, the only guy that I think has actually done that really, really well that I, I've got nothing but the utmost respect for is Peter O'Sullivan. You look at his body of work for the first four or 10 years in his academic career, going down that core stability pathway, doing all this stuff on back pain about how we got to try and get all these deep abdominal muscles working. And then he's realized, whoa, hold on. That other research looking like that's bullshit. I've made a mistake. That's years of my work. Just I'm going to throw out and I'm going to change tact. And he did that. And he's done that really well. And, and it, it actually, I think in my eyes and a lot of other people's eyes, that gives him actual much more kudos because he's actually done that to actually put your hand up and say i've made a mistake silly me oh dear let's change tack let's go down another way and you know and i i am again i hope i would do that i i don't know because i haven't come across it yet because but i i, I would hope that you know all of us would be able to do that but i do understand it's challenging and hard if we realize we've made a mistake we would put our hands up and accept it and move on yeah we we had to do it in product well we some of us have done it in podiatry, you know, with parad paradigm shifts and things like that. Um, last question, because I'm looking at the clock and I'm conscious of time, and I know you've got to shoot off. Um, and it's on, um, it's a question that came in beforehand. I didn't quite get to it. It seems a nice place to wrap things up, though. And that is um, the, the, the comment that someone, have, a comment you made that someone read about the possibility of there being some form of tiered care, where if manual therapy does have a place, um, then perhaps its delivery isn't most appropriate uh, from physiotherapists. Uh, and I think the comment or the, the analogy used was you don't often see surgeons um, changing dressings. I mean, in the UK, I've been in theatre before, surgeons don't even close up. The, the yeah. big boy stuff's done. They walk out and they just say to their registrar, right, so them up, kind of. So, um, I mean, by all means, if I've taken that context of your, uh, that quote of yours out of context, call me on it. But uh, how do you see the, the model working? Is, is, there a, is there a better way? Um, when it comes to manual therapy, uh, it, it's, it's a treatment that makes people feel better and nice. It's not essential. It's not a necessity. So when it comes to using uh, funds, resources, uh, for healthcare, it has to be an essential necessity. It has to be something that is, is, has been shown to have beneficial effects. Um, so manual therapy for me is not there. It's not at that same level. So it is something, as I say, I sometimes associate manual therapy with going to the spa for the day. You know, everybody feels nice, okay? On a day's trip to the spa, you go and have a bit of relaxation and everything. And everybody feels great afterwards. You know, you don't go for a day in the spa and feel worse. So should the NHS pay for everybody to go to the spa one day a week? No. That's just ridiculous thinking. What about the other thing? It all feels nice when we have a haircut and we get our, our nails done. Whoa, whoa. Know your company here, mate. Come on. <laughs> Some of us, <laughs> some of us feel great after a nice trim, okay, yeah. getting all the, everything nice and tidied up and getting our nails buffed. You know, that feels <laughs> great. Should the NHS or even private medical insurance companies cover that? No. So the, the argument is, is manual therapy just makes people feel better, but it's not essential. It's not, it's not a necessity. So when it comes to public funds and say even private medical insurance funds, it shouldn't be wasted on that. It, 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 there's, there's, a, there's much more useful things that that funds and those monies could be spent on. Now, if people want manual therapy because it does feel nice and they think it's worth their time and their energy and their effort, then they're going to have to pay for it. So that's the simple way I look at it. So it belongs in the service industry. It belongs in the hotel spas. It belongs in the beauty salons. It belongs in the gymnasiums. So it belongs in there. But the trouble with that is that it'll be probably unregulated. And then it could be open to all sorts of crap and woo as well. So, again, there is no, there's no simple answer. But for me, no, in healthcare, manual therapy doesn't belong. It just, it's a waste of time and resources. If you look at, you know, risk, not risk benefit, cost benefit, it's just skewed off. Absolutely skewed off. And it just clogs up physiotherapy departments. 
my God, the amount of sort of patients I want to get in to see urgently, you know, when I'm working my ESP role and I'm having to refer patients into physiotherapy departments because I can't actually do it myself because I'm just triaged, you know, I have got a, a one department that had a 16 week wait and I had somebody that, you know, I want to get in there urgently. I rung up the physio and said, can you get this patient in? I need somebody to see him next week and just start moving this bloody shoulder of this. It doesn't have to be anything sexy. They just need to guide them through it. This patient's very anxious. He's very concerned. I don't think he's going to do it on his own. Just need to get this patient going. Can you see him next week for me, please? And take him for six weeks and see how he goes. No, sorry, too busy. And, and the reason being is because they're backed up with, uh, again, I uh, just shit, you know, and, and therapists fucking massaging people with back pain and putting ultrasound on people and stuff along those lines. Just snarls up the system. These low intervent, these low value interventions are just stopping the higher value interventions being uh, uh, given and people are missing out the ones that actually need our help are missing out because the ones that actually don't need our help are just clogging up the system i think i ranted enough there that's beautiful that's i think craig unless you've got anything to add um no that's, that's not, uh, not, not, not a terrible place to wrap up no that's the, the, yes thanks so much adam i think that, that we haven't had any thorny questions come in lots of uh good good comment about what you're saying um hard to argue any of it so um did i, I offend I, anybody i did notice no, a lot of, no I did, disappointing I did notice a no. lot of people have joined <laughs> late so um if you want to come back in about 20 minutes the video will be on um facebook from the beginning and later on today australian time uh, it'll be on youtube so please, please go and subscribe to our youtube channel um so thanks again, Adam. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, mate. Um, it's been an enjoyable uh, 55 minutes. Uh, okay. yeah, thanks for inviting me on, guys. And you keep doing what you're doing because, again, I like what you're doing in the podiatry world, mate. You keep okay. challenging that bullshit.